Today is what we call ministry involvement. It's a very special day here. And today's message is that we're all part of the body of Christ. He gave his life for all of us. And as, as a body, we have a common goal. It's a goal that all, I mean, a purpose that all of us share. We word it this way here at the Edmund Church of Christ. We're all to be disciples and to make disciples. It's a task that all of us have. Something you do, I do, we all are in this together. But there are also some things that we can do as individuals to help the body of Christ here. And so we have these involvement forms and also a, a QR code on the screen. I uh, made this kind of a subtle slide. I hear some people are having a hard time getting it because I made it so subtle. But if you can't get it off of that, it's also in your little handout bulletin and other places if you're having trouble with the code. But uh, also, if you'd like to have a hard copy, we'd prefer you do an electronic version. But if you um, would prefer a hard copy just to follow along, we have some of those available as well. So if you just raise your hand, we have John's down here. He's got some, he's going to hand out. Raise your hand. And uh, yeah, there's back there just around here. Up in the balcony, we have some people up there too. Just keep your hand up. They'll make their way around and they'll get, they'll get this form to you. You feel free to follow along with one of these or use one of those if you'd like to. Is the QR code working? No. That is just so crazy. If you have your bulletin, the little one works. I have, I have my notes up here, and it works on my deal, too. Like Matt was saying, I just made it so subtle. You know, it's just you can hardly see it up there, can't you? Yep, I'm getting nothing either. So, life's good. Okay. It actually does work for some because some of you get it. See, I see some of you saying yes and some saying no. But believe me, it works. Hey, this is one of those times during the sermon, you can be on your phone and it's okay. All right? So if, 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 you, if you got the bulletin, in the, in, you can also go to your bulletin and you, there's a link there that you can click as well. But let, here's what I want you to think about. We're talking about ways that we can get involved. And all of us have ways. There are times when all of us need to do something. There he is. Let's say we're all over in Angel Park or you're out in the field with a whole bunch of people and all of a sudden a grass fire starts. All of us can st try and stomp it out, right? But that does not mean that all of us by profession are firefighters. But in an emergency, we can all stomp, right? But th this is not an emergency time. This is a time of planning and preparing. And so we're getting ready. And one of the ways to get ready is to think, how can I as an individual do something? And so we're going to look at this with some specific needs, and Matt's going to cover these in just a few moments. Here's just one thing I would observe. Some of you are new to us here at Edmond, and maybe you came to us from a larger congregation, and so we're a smaller congregation to you. But in our fellowship, we're a pretty large congregation. So better chances are you came from a small, smaller congregation to us. Whatever the case is, it's just different, isn't it? And sometimes people will say to me, you know, I came from a smaller congregation and I just can't get involved here. There's not, there's not enough things for me to do. I just want you to know the larger the congregation, the more there is to do, not the less. The difference that I think, maybe the maybe, this is Kent talking, one of the biggest differences is there's not as many public opportunities for public roles, like what I'm doing right now, flapping my face. I mean, obviously... Uh, if you want to do public reading and, and lead prayers and singing and all that, there are not, there, the need's not as great because there, we're just a whole, there's a whole bunch more people to do it. But the needs of people to be the body is no less here. In anything, it's even more. So, I want you to know in this process of ministry involvement, the most important person in this process is not the guy flapping his lips right now. The most important person in this process is Matt Burton. Matt's been working on this. He's done this with us for years. And Matt will be the first to tell you that he does not like to speak in public. I keep telling Matt, if you don't want to get up there and talk about it, then stop doing such a good job. But he would tell you he hates to be in, in this role. But I can also tell you another thing Matt's very good at, and that is in organizing and implementing. And so he helps us in that process. He's the most important part of this process, and so he's going to come at this time and share a little bit more about our involvement form. Matt? My life. Thank, thank you, Kent. It's a pleasure to be here to chat with you this morning. 
please excuse me while I try to get out of doing this uh, next time and get uninvited. I don't know if I have to take my shoes off and run through the crowd, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Um, I love Kent, but I'm going to have to disagree. I am I'm not an important piece of this. Uh, I merely work with the leaders to gather the inputs to involve you. So it's really the leaders and you that are important to this involvement. Um, and we appreciate all that you do. So it's been a while, obviously, since we've done this. Uh, 2020 was the last year I had to get up here and speak, thankfully, about it. Um, not, not that I don't like uh, happy and, and excited about involvement, but you know my role up here is not may maybe necessary. Um, but anyway, we were just going through the process of gathering inputs from all the volunteers and providing that list of volunteers to the ministry leaders when the pandemic hit. And obviously, a lot of things had to be paused. Most of our ministries were paused at that point and, and just put on the back burner for a while. But I'm excited that we're kind of coming out of that. All of our ministries are back online. And so this is kind of an exciting time to be able to push a form out there and put it in front of you to give you opportunity to, to get reinvolved in those things. So. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about the process. Not much has changed in the process, but I realize we have some new members, and it's been a while, so we'll briefly talk about what, how that looks. So in a normal year, just like this, we solicit inputs from all the ministry leaders on the needs that they have to fulfill their mission goals. We take those inputs, we, we compile them into an involvement uh, sign-up form, which is what you have via that QR code up there and in the paper form. Um, so it's purely from their input on, on needs that they have today. But this is where you come in. So what we're asking you to do is, whether it's through the electronic form or on the paper form, look at the different list of opportunities here, pray about it, try to find at least one, if you will, that you know, you're comfortable signing up for to get involved and submit your form within the next couple of weeks. That's all we ask. Now, the involvement form will be online and in paper form until we do this again next year. But we do ask that if you're here this morning and you're hearing this, we please, if you're going to submit a form, try to do it in the next couple of weeks. After, after um, Easter, which I believe is April 17th, we're going to begin collecting all those inputs that go into our CCB, Church Community Builder System, and providing those list of volunteers out to the ministry leaders. So that, roughly that time frame is when you can expect to first start hearing from some of your ministry leaders. Now, some of them may reach out to you immediately because they have an urgent need. But in general, most of them don't have an urgent need, so give them a little bit of time to make contact. We put their names on the form, not because they want their names there. They, they don't want the publicity. They're very humble. But we put it there so that you can reach out to them if you have any questions about their ministry and what it entails. Also, if you want to follow up after volunteering for one of these, please feel free to do so. They welcome proactive communication. All right, so we talked a bit about the process. Now let's switch over to the forum. So again, I know that most of you probably already either tried to attempt to pull up the electronic form and hope that you were successful or you have a paper copy. Um, if you're able, please, we encourage you to use the electronic form. It does minimize a little bit of work in the background for the staff but there's no problem with using the, the paper copy if that's what's more convenient for you or it's just not feasible to pull this up. Now, we'll say if we're not asking for everybody to submit a form this morning. If you feel inclined, that's great. If you want to go home and pray about it and consider the many hundred, the, the 103 different opportunities that are on this form, we encourage it. And you can access this form via our form, uh, form link on our website. So if you don't have this QR code when you get home, don't, don't worry about it. You can pull it up on your computer. Now, please note that our ministry leaders make use of CCB, as I mentioned before, uh, our church community builder. So please make sure that your contact information is accurate in CCB because that's how they're most likely going to make contact with your phone number that's listed there and your email address. All right. Now, despite my tendency to walk through all 103 opportunities, like I maybe have done in the past, I'm going to cut that short. We're going to focus on just 52 this time. Kit says we have plenty of time today, so uh, so buckle up. No, in seriousness, seriousness, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through the, that level of detail. They're mostly self-explanatory, but I do I do want to highlight a couple ones. Ones that are new, and ones that are in, are in particular need. So, if you have the form in front of you, you can look at it while we're going through this, or or just make note. So Dave Laxon has a new opportunity under building 
under the building readiness heading. And what that entails is getting things ready for a service or event. You know, we, we have, um, um, we have this, this, the quad, which is extremely flexible for different events, but it also requires work, setting up the chairs, taking down the chairs, cleaning up. He could use help with that. So if you feel inclined to help for events, and you're not signing up for every event, you're just signing up to be contacted when they need help. And if you're available, that's great. He also needs help cleaning up the grounds whenever we have a storm, just like when we had recent ice storms or snowstorms. I will call out the children's ministry. Um, they're probably one of the biggest users of the results of this form, I would say. Um, and they have some urgent needs coming up this summer with VBS, so consider that. Communion packets. So the last time we did this, we didn't have communion packets, but we do now. And so they're looking for help for anybody that's willing to help assemble communion packets and prep for their service. And then there's Grief Share. Grief Share is not a new ministry. It's been around for quite a while, but I mention it because, one, it is helping people deal with grief, which is, which is a good thing. We all go through grief at some point. But two, Alan and Jeanette have been leading this for 14 years. And as you can imagine, helping people go through grief and deal with grief for 14 years is quite taxing. So they're looking for help. Anybody that's willing to learn how to conduct a session by observing sessions, and be willing to lead it if they're comfortable at that point. So please consider that. And the last one I'll mention today is the prison ministry. This one too is not new. It started in uh, 2018 by David Denton and Roy Greenway. The, the focus of this is to engage with the Oklahoma City and Carver Transitional Centers here in Oklahoma City. Those centers are minimal security and are intended to help uh, men make their transition from prison into normal life for those that have been incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. Okay, this is an excellent ministry that, they, that Roy and David have started. They become certified to go into these centers and teach Bible classes. So they're asking people that are willing to go do that or transport um, prisoners here for service. Um, we, have, we have been blessed with having many of them come and worship with us and get to know us. And so that, that is a tremendous blessing. I encourage you, if you feel inclined, please consider this, min this ministry. Now, I obviously didn't mention them all. Uh, for your sake, uh, but they're all very important, and they all have needs. None are maybe less or more important than any others. If there's a box on this form, that's because they have a need, so please consider that. I will say, first of all, don't feel guilty if you don't find anything on there to submit. We know that this congregation is very active. There's a lot of behind the scene things going on by all of you, and so if you can't find anything in this form that's convenient for you or, or something you just can't do, don't feel, don't feel guilty about that. We just want to make this available so that you can get involved. But with the size of the congregation, as you can imagine, our ministry leaders can't come to each of you and personally invite you to get involved in their, in their ministry. So that's why we put this form together. This is the personal invitation to you to consider each one of these and find a way to get involved if you can. So in recap, Review the form, pray about it, and submit it. And within a few weeks or, or a few months, you will be contacted if you volunteer for one of these things. So I hope you all prayerfully consider each one of them and think about ways to use your gifts to serve the Lord. And I'll leave you with a verse uh, in, in, this, in this regards. Romans 12, 6. We each have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So let us all consider the gifts we have and find a way to serve God. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. You did too good. You're back next year. <laughs> hey, I, I'd just add to what he said. Obviously, not everything we do is on that form because a lot of the needs aren't, aren't necessarily looking for somebody right now. Those are ones that identified needs that they had. So there's very likely you're already doing things and very involved. And uh, your ministry that you're interested in is not on there. That's, that's understandable. But I imagine just about all of us could find some other way to help. Many parts, one body. That's what we're talking about today out of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. A lot of times when Paul had a message he wanted to, to portray, he, would, uh, he used a very special literary tool. He would tell you what he's going to say, and then when he was through with it, he told you what he said, and to make sure you got it right in the middle, he would say the main point. It's really kind of fun to look at. And in our text today, we get to see it clearly. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14, Paul writes... Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. 
And then in verse 27, all the way at the end, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And if you look right in the middle, you can make sure you get the point he's trying to make. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And so what he's trying to tell us very clearly is that, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're one. We are one body. And when you look at us, when you think about us, you think of a oneness of us, how we are one body. Let me illustrate it. In your bulletin this last week, you probably saw this picture. When I see this picture, I immediately think of the McAllen mission trip. That's a picture of the group. We stopped in San Antonio on the way back and took this picture. Now, when you see a group picture like this, and let's say you, you were a part of the group that went, the first thing you do, they, they immediately, when they saw this, said, oh, yeah, I remember us taking that picture. I remember this group. If you're like me, the second thing you do is you look for yourself. You know, see if you can find. And, you know, I know it's a lot of people. I can see a few folks in there that I can recognize. Then you look for others you know. And, and so I just have to tell you, though, if you look at that picture, you're not going to see me. I, I, let me change the perspective of the picture to show you where I am in this picture. Next slide. There you go. I was taken the picture. And the fact that I am not in the picture of the group, does that make me not a part of the group? I mean, maybe I'm just a shadow, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't a part of that group. And when I see the picture, I know I was a part of that. In fact, I might argue in that picture, I was the most important person, not in the picture, because I took it. We're all a part of it. Here's the point of today's message. Don't think that you are less important, a less important part of the body. And don't think you're a more important part of the body. Instead, think about how you are the body. That's who we are. Paul was very concerned about unity in the body. In Corinth, in the early church, in the church. All right, so we're fixing to go through some t text, and this is one of those great times. It'd be wonderful to it, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 11, or 12, or 13. We're going to go with all of them. And we're going to big picture this, okay? Instead of just going verse by verse and, and digging out the little details, we're going to big picture that, because Paul is addressing a, a big image. In 1 Corinthians 11, he's talking to these Christians in Corinth that would come together for a fellowship. They called it a, a love feast. It was just a meal. Some of the favorite times for those uh, more wealthier members of the church in Corinth was to do that in the middle of the afternoon because they, that's when they like to have these big fellowships. The only problem was the slaves and the laborers couldn't make it at that time because they were still working. And so he's going, don't do things together as a body when some can't make it. And then he likens it to the, the Lord's Supper. And, and Travis so beautifully talked about that, how we are one he says, being a group, being the body is so important. And then he also addressed another issue in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11, about spiritual gifts. Some people there were thinking, oh, man, I, I wish I had this gift. I wish I could do what that person does. Then I'd be really important. Or people might have been thinking, I can do this and they can't, so I'm more important than they are. And he's saying, that's not how you need to look at things. We are the body. We are all important. So we pick up the text in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. And I'm, we're going to read the text to help let it make the point and pause occasionally. Here we go, verse 12. Just as a body, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. Because of Jesus Christ and us giving ourselves to him, when we were baptized, the Lord added us to the church, to the body. And so we are together. This, our world loves to categorize and, and, uh, and highlight how we're, we're different. And Paul's saying that's not what we do in the body. It does, it's not about nationality. It's not about race. It's not about financial status. It's not about gender. 
we are one. We are made this one body through Jesus and gifted through the Spirit. Let's continue on in verse. We were all given the one Spirit to drink. And so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. This body is made up of different parts, but we're all a part of it. And we need to see ourselves that way. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? You know, we all have a role to play. We are different, but we are the body. And we need to see ourselves as that body. Verse 18, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Because without each of us, we're not the body. Verse 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So just because you're a part of the body that's not seen by everybody and acknowledged by everybody does not mean that we're not a part of the body. And he continues in verse 25. There should be no division in the body. Its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I mean, at times, we all say something like, I have a headache, or I have a backache, or my finger hurts. And then we would say, I am in pain. I mean, I recognize where the pain is coming from, but I hurt. I feel. It is the body. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Get it? Now, this is something I struggle with. I, I very, I have a struggle with mixing metaphors. I forget when I leave one metaphor and go to another one. And so what Paul is trying to say is, the body is made up of many parts and we are the body. Got it? Now he's going to continue on and say, now as you're part of the body, it, let's look at us as individuals. As our part. Doesn't mean that we're not a part of the body. We're going to set that metaphor aside and we're going to look at ourselves as individuals. And this is what he has to say to individuals. Verses 28 through 30, he talks about these gifts. Now, we're doing big pictures, so I can't talk to you about the three different lists that we see in this, happen around these passages of those gifts and the different orders and so the importance and some things like that. But one of the things they obviously were struggling with is they would say, oh, I would like to be like the apostles, or I would like to be like a prophet, or I want to be a teacher, or I want to be able to prophesy, I want to be able to help, I want to guide, I want to speak in tongues. These are the big things that people see, and I want to be able to do those big things as individuals. And then in verse 31, he makes this comment. Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. I'd love to dig into this text for a little bit longer. Let me just tell you that those two words, eagerly desire, are earlier translated jealous or jealously. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad translation, but I am saying you could, trans, a, a alternate translation of this could be, are you jealously desiring the greater gifts? But let's go with the way it's translated here. Let's stick with this, okay? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. I think it's okay for me as an individual to want to do better, to be better, to learn, to grow, to be a better part 
of the body. Do you agree? We should all want to do better and be better. And if that is your desire, and I hope it is, then Paul would say to us, I'll show you the most excellent way to make that happen. Let me show you how to make that happen in an excellent way. And we find ourselves now in 1 Corinthians 13. And Paul changes his language. And he goes to first person. He owns this. And he says something like this, you know, if I speak in the tongues that, that make angels and men look at me, but I don't have love, I'm just a clanging symbol. If I can tell all mysteries and knowledge but don't have love, what good is that? If I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love. And Paul's saying, I have that kind of faith. I can speak in tongues. I can prophesy. If I give all that I have to help the poor, Paul gave it all. If I give my body to, to suffer for Christ's behalf, and he did. He says, I've done all these, but if I did all that and I didn't have love, it is worth it. So want to do better? Here's the excellent way. Don't just pursue these other things. Pursue love, because love is patience. It's kind. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It always protects, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. So you want to be a better part of the body? Pursue love and a loving spirit. Because where there's prophecies, they're going to cease. Where there are tongues, they're going to be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it's going to pass away. Because right now we just know in part, but then we are going to know completely. Things change. Gifts will cease. And then Paul says something that really speaks to me in a powerful way. He says, when I was a child... I talk like a child, I thought like a child, I reason like a child. And to me, at least, as I reflect on this, it kind of speaks to me and how I mirror the world. This world does not teach this pattern that Paul is saying. And when we model ourselves as a, a, an organization or a church or a body of faith, after this world, we do say there are more important people than others. More important things. And he's saying, that's not how it is with us. Jesus would say, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. He would tell his disciples, you've heard it said, you want to make a difference in this world? You've got to be the president. You've got to be the most important one. And I say, no, you don't. If you want to make a difference in the kingdom, you become the least. It's a different way of looking at things. And so all too often, I look at myself in the body of faith in the reflection, in the mirror of the world. But instead, I need to look at it in the mirror of Christ and his life and change my way of thinking and change my perspective until I can see clearly in eternity. And then he finishes that chapter by saying, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Chapter 14, verse 1, first part. Follow the way of love. All right, so just to make it clear, the last verse of chapter 12, he says, I'll show you a most excellent way. And then at the end of 13, he says, the greatest of these is love. And then he starts 14 by saying, follow the way of love. Make love your aim. That's the way we improve who we are and what we do. Now, just to get a little bit personal, this is Kent talking here as I try and struggle with these not just now, but struggled all through my life. You know, as a Christian, I had always heard this concept of have to. Do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? You have to do that. You ever heard the have to talk? I remember as a teenager especially really struggling with that. Go ahead and hit that I have to slide. And so that didn't sound right to me. And I remember teaching lessons. It's not that you have to. What you want is God to work in you so much that you want to do. I, had, I taught a class in, when I was in campus ministry. I want to want to please him. Learning to change your want to. Some of you are in my campus ministry. You probably remember. I, I harped on that. How you, you grow to want to do what's right. And as I, but still, it wasn't quite there yet. And then it occurred to me, what, you, what changes my want is what I love. I love to. And so I have prayed for years. God, help me to love you more today than I did yesterday and more tomorrow than I... I do today, to, to learn to grow in love to the point 
that I would want to do stuff instead of having to. I've prayed that in my marriage, with my kids, with my work. And still, it just didn't quite seem there. Because I know some people who serve in this congregation, I could call you by name, that, that you help people in need. And do you have to? No. Do you want to? Yes. Do you love it? Yes. Except it's a backed up septic tank. And you don't love to do that, do you? And yet they do it over and over again. And I thought of a mom who at 2 o'clock in the morning gets up and takes care of a sick child and cleans up the mess and washes their child and changes their bed and starts the laundry at 2 o'clock in the morning. You love to do that? Do you want to do that? Do you have to do that? Now, I used a mother at 2 a.m., but you put in a caregiver. You, give, you put in any of us doing things. And I think what, I, I think after reading this passage, I would change it. I love, so I do. I love, so I, I do. Do you love getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning? No. But you love that child, so you do. I love, so I love to take care of my child. I love, so I love to serve. I love, so I want to. I mean, if my baby's sick, I want to take care of them. I love, so I have to. You see, it's a big difference. There's a big difference. I don't know if this resonates with you or not. But sometimes people ask me, do you have to do that? Yep, because I love. Yep. I have a choice, but because of what was done for me, I have to because I want to, because I love to, because I love. All right, so I probably didn't describe it too great, but I'll give you a really good uh, illustration. How about just John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Did God have to give his son? Did he want to take a part of him and let it die, be separated from him because of the sins of the world? Did he love doing that? Well, I tell you what, God is love. And because he loved, he loved that sacrifice. He wanted, he had to. Because he wanted to have an eternal relationship with you and with me. Friend, if you're not a, a Christian, that's what it's all about then. It's about love. And we can respond to that love and in a similar fashion to what Jesus did for us. We recognize that we're headed the wrong direction. We decide we want to change. We confess Christ is Lord of life, not us in charge anymore. We submit to him and say he is going to be in control. And then we confess his name. We are baptized in the waters of baptism just like Christ entered the grave. And we are raised a new life in relationship with God to live this life of love. And for brother and sister in Christ, for many of us, we've kind of wandered. We are just in a have-to stage. Let's remember at the core is love. I love, so I do. It determines all of my actions. Well, we're fixing to sing a song. It's the song, Lord, Take Control. It's a beautiful thought at this moment. And I hope you'll spend a moment in reflection. If you've never given your life to Christ in baptism, we hope you'll do so right now. We also have uh, some shepherds and their wives that are going to be in the parlor praying for us. They would love to pray for you as well. If you'd like to join them during the singing of this song, make your way there as well. May God bless you in this journey of being the body. You need to respond publicly. Would you do so as we stand together and sing? My heart, my mind, my 